Welcome everyone to a special episode tonight. Tonight we will be talking about The Leech with the writer and director Eric Pennykoff. J-Mac, we get sent a lot of requests to watch a lot of different things and whatever people have seen us watch and review here is usually the best of the, the bunch. Um, sometimes we've had to review some stuff that we're like... How are we going to do it without offending anyone? But thankfully, <laughs> thankfully tonight, uh, it almost feels like a night off because we actually enjoyed the hell out of the leech. Agreed? Yeah, absolutely. It, it was it was just the type of film that I was in the mood to watch as well. I didn't know what type of film it was because the trailer doesn't even really give too much away. Um, but I, I was 20, 20 minutes in, I was like, I'm, I'm loving this. And then it just continues to, to build. And uh, <laughs> surprise, it was yeah pretty awesome. But anyway, we'll I, I, probably talk about that later. <laughs> of course. I, I love the symbolism with the movie. But then again, there's also just parts where I, I, like I'm, I'm invested and I'm watching. And I just completely piss myself laughing. Um, <laughs> we, will, we will get into those parts, which are brilliant. Uh, I always love it. So I'm going to go ahead and play the trailer for everyone. Uh, you can find it in the description here. And I'll post it again, the links to go ahead and buy physically. There's nothing better than buying a physical PC media. So I, if you can... Oh. Yeah, we're big proponents of that here. Physical media is still is still the way mm -hmm. forward for us. Absolutely. To be able to hold something in your hand and go, I own this, and it's class. And That's, special uh, edition as well. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> love a wee uh, steel book or something. <laughs> oh, don't you, don't you get me started. Um, and you can also go ahead and watch it on Prime as of the 5th of December. So again, follow the links and check it out as soon as you can. But here is the trailer for... God. Do not board up your homes for fear of God's little ones. They are like as ever, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Eric Pennykoff. Eric, Yo. it's a pleasure to have you on with us, mate. Um, like J Mac and I said, we're uh, so dying to speak to you about it because sometimes, like I say, we've watched a few, and hey, we've had some really good stuff as well, but of not of recent, not of complete recent. But when when I had I had watched it before J Mac, and he goes how good is it and i was like you're gonna enjoy it um and you went into that with that exact mind frame and it was just for us brilliant because i don't know there's not a lot of a uh, horror i mean would you class it as a horror yeah i always called it a horror comedy um mm -hmm. you know but kind of the horror comedy my my favorite type of horror comedy for example the original black christmas where mm -hmm. you know the the comedy and the horror sort of never cross over you know there's never really yeah. a kill that's funny all the comedy mm -hmm. comes from you know, the dad looking for his daughter and the cops that don't yeah. know what they're doing. That's all absolutely like hilarious by like 70s idiot police <laughs> standards. But then all the kills and everything that makes it like a scary Christmas movie yeah, is yeah. genuinely scary. But for me, that's a horror comedy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, like we didn't, the the gruesome stuff is gruesome. The funny part for me was like um, <laughs> when the priest goes into the guy's room and he's like, where was it? What is he? He'd lost J Mac. And it's he his goes, dog collar. His dog. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, you left him here last night <laughs> just before we fucked. <laughs> that, that yeah, we, I, 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 think we, I think we either maintained our core audience or we lost people. That. <laughs> we could have gone either way. <laughs> it, was a, it was a big risk to take with a joke like that. I mean, it, I mean, the, the kind of central character to the story is a priest, which is a, an awesome move, by the way. It's, yeah. I mean, if it was just a regular guy whose house was kind of getting, kind of, people were overstepping their boundaries in, in the guy's house, you'd be like, okay, but because it's a priest, you just, there's, there's something, <laughs> there's something even more Pure. darkly comic about the whole thing. Um, right. And um, you know, I honestly felt, see the minute it came on, the, the style of it, it felt like a Christmas movie. Right, and and what I loved about it is you, that it almost as much as there's a lot of effort in there, almost felt effortlessly. I was expecting John Candy to pop out at any point, right? That's <laughs> and and to me that's important when you put something on, right? To 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 feel a certain way. And what was it? Uh, T. Bartakis had said as he said that it was that that was called what was the word he used for it? Um, um the enchantment oh, of a movie. Ench enchantment, yeah. yeah. The enchantment of a movie, which is quite important. Um. So that for me had me hooked already, and another thing as well is sometimes in it, it's quite a it's a thing that happens quite often now with movies. Is a lot of time there's dialogue that just doesn't grip you, and sometimes you feel there's too much of it. This did not suffer from that at all. I felt that everything that was happening was happening for a reason, and I was invested, like in the same kind of way that Tarantino does it. You know, a lot of his scenes are just people sitting talking in a cafe. 
but yet there's story there and you, you're you're hooked. Did you feel that way also about it, J-Mac? Yeah, I mean, it, your, the dialogue was amazing. You, you wrote this film as well as mm -hmm. uh, directing it. Um, now, what what was the where did where did the idea come from for this story? Well, you know, really, it, it's one of those things that was partially born out of, you know, when COVID hit and everyone had to kind of put a pause on their lives and figure out, you know, what what's next? What can we do? This and that. I mean, you know, I remember a, a big inspiration was kind of like a lot of people saying, oh, filmmakers are going to need to learn how to make smaller movies with less money, fewer locations, fewer actors. You know, you're going to have to really learn to buckle down and make things with nothing. I think a lot of us indie filmmakers were kind of looking at each other like, you know, we've been <laughs> we've been doing this before. <laughs> you know, so so in what, it, it, it definitely still presented a new challenge. But I think in terms of scaling things back, you know, my first movie was made for about the same amount of money. It has you know about the same amount of locations, about the same scale cast, and that was made you know before COVID, and it was you know kind of a lot financially and as as the producer of this movie was very similar and kind of like the scope and what we could do. Um, so I think you're really reliant on a script that's hopefully really good that people connect with and also um, a cast that's really engaging when you only have a few people in a couple locations, you know, you better want to look at them for an extended period of time, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, a two hour movie or in this case, an 80 minute movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, I, I mean, it is a very compact movie. I mean, the, the, the 80 four. minute runtime um, yeah. it was, do you have, was there a longer cut of that that you, that you, kind of scaled back a little bit or was it always aimed to be that kind of length? Yeah, I think I always knew I wanted it to be around the 82 minute mark. Um, you know, I'm, it's funny, I think it's Roger Corman that said the 82 minute movie is 20% cheaper to make than the 83 minute movie because at least back then it meant one less film reel, which meant your yeah. shipping costs were 20% less. So it's funny how something like that that's basically obsolete, you can make a movie as long as you want and it's, you know, mm. costs the same amount to get out there. But I do think that there's, there's something sweet about that kind of like between 80 and 85 minute length mm -hmm. where, you know, I, I, maybe for me personally, the, the types of films that I can make on this budget with with the resources that I have, it's always kind of felt like get in fast and get out fast. Like, you know, get in, do what you're going to do and get out and don't really have those final few minutes drag on too much because we all know what it's like to watch a great movie and then it just kind of can't really transition mm -hmm. to the end. Maybe it's got a great end, but getting there is, you know. Yeah. Uh, a, a little yeah. rocky. So yeah, I, I think I, the, the script is probably about 85 pages long. You know, the first cut's always a lot longer than it needs to be. Um, there's not a whole lot of stuff that got cut out of the movie. Most of what I wrote made it in. Um, mm. But yeah, that, that's kind of where we're aiming at with these with these uh, sort of low budget horror films is trying to get at that, that sweet 83 minute mark, I think. What kind of budget did you have on this? Uh, you know, both this movie and my first movie were made for under 60,000. Um, wow. which is not a lot to make a movie. I mean, you know, I know people that have made short films with budgets bigger than that. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've made a handful of short films when I first got started, but I never was putting any serious money into them. They just kind of felt like exercises. Um, but yeah, you yeah. know, and I, I, th I think in order to pull off a film like this on that type of budget, you know, you have to have had built your film family over the years. You can't just one mm -hmm. day say, I don't know anyone in filmmaking and I want to make a $60,000 <laughs> feature film, you know, really it's like I, having worked as an editor for a number of years and having you know, worked on other people's films, it's just calling in favors and being fortunate enough to know a few really great actors, uh, crew that you've worked with on different things that you can bring in for not a lot of money. And, you know, they understand that, you know, you're, you're doing this once or twice and you only pull this favor so often. Um, mm. So I, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of like decades worth of work you kind of got to put into uh to get people on board to, to work at the scale you're working on some of these smaller movies. Yeah. How long did it, it sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, how long did the shoot take? I don't know why I forgot that question. That was the simplest question I could ask and I, it, it went out of my head. We shot it, you know, we shot 15 days. So we shot three weeks, uh, Monday through Friday. We took the weekends off. We were all sort of in a bubble together, living in the same place where we were shooting. So. You know, there were no PAs or additional hands that were coming and going on any day. Uh, as much as people offered to to want to help out friends or family or whoever, it's like, you know, sorry, if you're you're either in this bubble or you're not. And, you know, we're masking up and testing and doing all of these things that were before a vaccine was available. So it was, uh, you know, it definitely nerve wracking as far as being the producer of this as well. Mm. Um, 
but yeah, we found that once we were once we were in that bubble, you know, fifteen days felt like adequate amount of time to to make this movie. Mm. Con- considering it took fifteen days to shoot with the budget that you had, the film looks great. I have to say the 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 cinematography is like really. I mean, it, I mean, it's something like the the simple shots that you've got, like just the your, your standard uh, setups and your your panning shots. That's all cool. But then towards the end, there's some pretty kind of crazy. Uh, shooting that goes on in it and it looks amazing it really kind of knocks you back a little bit when you're watching it um and yeah kudos to to you and your cinematographer for managing to um to pull that off and that time scale as well is really impressive well kudos to him definitely i mean you know i've known him for years he shot a couple short films of mine and he is you know he's one of those guys who you know fortunately the way his life is positioned and the way that he you know, the jobs that he works on for the paycheck to afford the time to work on things like this. It's uh, it's really sort of like the ideal situation you want to find in a lot of these key collaborators because, you know, he came out and fundamentally was his own gaffer. I mean, a lot of us helped pre-light the plays, but we didn't have, you know, a designated gaffer. We didn't have a designated key grip or anything like that. And, you know, his experience as a gaffer as well as a DP was sort of the, the, the perfect combination of the person you really need to make movies like this is, you know, when it comes to camera, you got to find someone that can operate their own camera. I would operate the camera on occasion. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the sort of the job boundaries are, are uh, they cross over a bit on films like these. There's really no one saying, I'm not going to touch that because that's not my job. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people that on this film, people that I've worked with over the years, we've all worked in different positions on films. Uh, you know, two, both Jeremy and Graham are directors in their own right as well as writers, um, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot of multi-hyphenates from the, uh, the cast on down to the crew. Yeah. Uh, the performances from, from Jeremy and Graham were phenomenal. Uh, it struck both of us uh, how how much Graham reminded us of Zach Galifianakis. I don't know if that was, <laughs> if that, that must have been mentioned before at some point. You know, so I, I actually never saw it, and it's not until we first started putting images out that people brought that up and I, I, I totally get where they're coming from, but it never, it never struck me uh, on set. You know, I, I think it's certainly the beard being a part of it, which, uh, you know, him and I talked at length about whether this guy, this young priest would have a beard or not. And I was insistent on him having a beard because he looks so much like a Catholic priest that I had as a teacher in high school right. for a short amount of time. And looking back on it, they were probably about the same age. And this guy just is a dead ringer for Graham Skipper with the beard. So it just, mm. it kind of just felt appropriate. Um, you know, I, I certainly stick by that decision. <laughs> yeah. he, even, he even sounds like him. <laughs> his voice, his cadence, everything. I was like, it really is reminding me of Zach here. Um, uh. But he's definitely his, his own his own person. His, his performance was amazing, as was was Jeremy's. He was, he was really charming in a very bad way. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Had you, had you worked with both of them previously um, on other projects? or? Yeah, so Jeremy and Taylor, who plays Lexi in the film, they were both in my first mm-hmm. movie, Sadistic Intentions. And then Graham I had known for years. Uh, we lived in the same city with each other for a while and just became friends and always wanted to work with him. Had never quite seen him in a role like this, but knew he had it in him and talking to him a lot about this as I was writing it. Uh, I learned a lot about his background um and yeah it just seemed like the more i talked to the cast which was happening very early on in the process the more it seemed like this movie could be made and i think that these these actors as these characters are believable yeah Yeah, they were definitely really good janice says hey hey guys todd a surprise says if you're looking if sorry if you're shooting in kansas city anytime look me up i can edit shoot video photography and pull cable there you go (laughs) hell yeah i'd love to be in kansas city i'd love to make movies everywhere Damn right, uh, Todd. Todd surprises. I think he's been everywhere, hasn't he? Yeah, he's, he's a very interesting guy, Todd. He's had a very interesting, a, a very interesting life. Yeah. Um, Janice says teamwork is what it's all about. That's and the truth. Donna Park says, "Hey guys, how are y'all doing? Fantastic." <laughs> yeah, Donna. We're, hope you're doing we're good. Her. We're sitting here. We're talking to a filmmaker. This is this is as good as it gets. Wait, yeah, see, we we we've, we've been working on a short film for uh, what, way too long now. <laughs> It's um, obviously we all have our day jobs and and stuff, but like we kind of we understand uh, what you're talking about with getting people doing multiple roles on set and nobody nobody mm-hmm. complaining about it. It's like one minute, 
one minute you're acting on screen, the next minute you're you're going to buy lunch. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's it, you know, but, I, I think right. if you're gonna, you know, you're directing these movies or you're producing these movies, it's like at a certain point you realize you just have to be that person that's calling everyone or texting everyone and trying to convince mm -hmm. them how fun it would be to wake up early and get that shot just as the sun. <laughs> it's like, you know, and maybe maybe internally that's not who. You know, certainly not who I was when I was a teenager. That's the last thing I was doing was waking up early and try to get a great shot. But I don't know, you transition into making these movies and you just have that moment with yourself where it's like, well, I guess I just have to be the person to lead the charge. Mm -hmm. and I better I better believe it in myself if I'm going to try to convince other people to, you know, sacrifice their time and potential better money to come out and work on these small movies. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think the, the, the indie filmmakers that I know that seem to do the best at that seem to genuinely believe that it will be fun and that there is that they are encouraging people to work at a level that they normally don't work even if they're not getting paid as much money as they normally would um, yeah so I, I think it's like as, as being a filmmaker is as much about just having like an infectious personality and trying to like spread encouragement constantly because uh you know the second you get stressed out about waking up early no one else is going to wake up early yeah <laughs> Yes, yeah, that's, that's what this guy does. <laughs> Sometimes to my own detriment. <laughs> <laughs> All been there. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you see there being a, a sequel to Leech or something in the same kind of universe? I know that a lot of filmmakers are doing that kind of thing these days. Is that something? I don't know what a sequel would be, but I'm uh, if, if, if anyone's got a pitch, I'm open to hear it. <laughs> hey, I pitched uh, I pitched a movie which could kind of work with us. To the, we, the last guy we had on was. Uh, He's he created Sharknado. Um, oh, cool, cool. And uh, God, why is his name slipped me right now? I know his name, um, <laughs> Ferranti, Anthony C. Ferranti. Yeah. And uh, my Christmas pitch was a movie called um, Advent Calendar, where every <laughs> it's like a nice. you know like Jumanji's a, a board game that's kind of like a, a a board game that is not just a board game. Well, this is an Advent Calendar. It's quite the same. There's no escape in it. And each day like before christmas every day of that month you open it up someone related to the guy holding it gets killed brutally by something that comes out of it so if you take different properties i know it probably costs a lot of money but take different properties <laughs> from different movies you know one day it's freddy krueger next day it's the next guy. you know what i mean but you could do that if you make enough movies i reckon the advent calendar could become something of, of a horror creator i can see it yeah i can see it you know uh this company glass eye picks uh, it's run by Larry Fessenden, who's produced and directed a lot of great films over the years. Um, I was an intern there years ago, and I think it was around that time they started this tradition of a, a horror advent calendar that they would ship out to people. They had a whole slew of great merch. Um, oh, wow. But it's got me thinking about, yeah, the little pull tabs that you open up, and it's got a new a new thing behind it. Uh, I'm, I'm into yeah. it. It's, it's a good idea for an anthology. Ah, anthologies are phenomenal. I'm always behind an anthology. Todd Surprise says, filmmaking is a dream. I've done TV interview shows, radio, podcast, but doing a film, that's up there with making an album for me. He also goes on to say, what do you look for in a movie when you watch as a movie fan yourself? That's a good question, Todd. I mean, the thing that I, I think if I'm just looking to forget that I'm wa either watching a movie or I'm not just not thinking about like, you know, what I should be doing otherwise like right you know I, I think that's the thing when you're a filmmaker it's like i've watched so many movies and there are those times where unless a movie's really pulling me and i might be thinking like yeah, i really could be sitting down to work on that script or go over mm -hmm. here and finish uh mm -hmm. this batch of deliverables for this movie i'm finishing up or whatever it is i mean there's always there's always things to occupy yourself with as a filmmaker and i think uh the the, the true trick and the magic is sitting down and just being engrossed by a movie and not thinking about all that silly filmmaker mm -hmm. shit that's always swimming around mm -hmm. your head. Um, so I think it just has to be really, really good. I mean, going to a movie theater certainly helps me um, these days. You know, I, I love my Blu-ray collection and I got a great little spot I can sit back here and watch mm -hmm. stuff, you know, still in a theater. It's just like, it, it commands your attention. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. Definitely does. For me, do you have a do you have a favorite, do you have a favorite movie? Or is that just one of these impossible to answer questions? Uh, I mean, you know, if we're thinking, what talking like Christmas horror movies, certainly, uh, you know, certainly the original Black Christmas. Uh, there's this great French movie called, uh, I believe the alt title is Dial Code Santa Claus. It's this movie that came <laughs> out like right before Home Alone. And it's basically this kid in a huge house that he lives in and this, uh, this Santa 
breaks in and the kid has to fight Santa and he dresses <laughs> up like Rambo at a certain point because this is made in 1988. I think Rambo three had just come out. So he, yep. he has like Rambo toys. It, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's streaming out there somewhere. I, I want to believe, say it's called uh, some, some French title dial, dial code Santa Claus. You'll find it. I, it's mm, that sounds awesome. really, 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 up. really great. That's... I only saw it a few years ago and it's like top of my list for Christmas movies. now. Oh, nice. That's awesome. It, it almost, it sounds like home alone might have stolen ideas from that. Just the, the way you're describing it. Yeah. I mean, it's got the same central idea of like little kid, you know, faces off against, uh, you know, home intruder while his mom, who's like this rich toy store executive is out of the house. Mm. And, uh, Somehow, no, you know what it is. Somehow, this kid finds a way to communicate with this guy posing as Santa Claus through this like strange thing in France in the late '80s called the Minitel. It was like a pre-internet way of talking to people, kind of like an ATM machine. It was like this weird public-facing device from like the little bit that I understand about it. So this kid somehow talks to this guy posing as Santa Claus, and he's just really like a burglar looking to break into like some kid's house. Is mm. like the setup that I remember. It's a real weird piece of technology that sounds like it was maybe not in existence much more after that. But it is the year right before Home Alone, and it's uh, oh, making a double yeah. feature with it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so going, back, going back to yours, you get <laughs> going back to your project. Um, the did you have did you have auditions for for your your main actors, or did did you just go? I have this role for you. No, these were really, you know, these were offered roles um, just mm -hmm. because there's no, yeah, I don't know, to bring people into this type of movie during the time that we made it, the way that we made it, it's like, they, they were all friends of mine. And I'm very fortunate that I happen to be friends with a few really great actors and incredibly talented crew members. So that's, you know, something that uh, I've personally been able to kind of pull together a couple times now. Um, but yeah, no, they were roles that were offered. I started speaking with Graham about it immediately as soon as the idea started to kick around. And then, you know, Rio Taylor, Jeremy, everyone after that. These are people that I've known either as actors or in other capacities over the years. Yeah. Mm. yeah. We got another comment here from C. Matthew. It's Craig Matthew. And he says, I thought up a Christmas crime movie. Gonna call it Jesus Heist. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What is that? That, it, that reminds me a little bit of, there's that Duke Mitchell movie called Gone with the Pope about these like mobsters. That kid, they, they kidnap the Pope and the ransom money is a dollar from every Catholic in the world. And I'm like, that is, might be the most like ingenious like setup for a movie I've ever heard. You know, it's not even a, it's not even a bad idea. <laughs> uh, Jenny says, I still, I, I still love that idea, Kev. Uh, <laughs> Advent calendar. One day, one day, Advent calendar. Todd Surprise says, 100% correct about going to movie theatre. It makes an experience. Thanks for answering the question. Good stuff, guys. Um, aye, movie theatres, uh, again, right now is uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a decline where we're at. But I think in another couple of years, we'll, we'll see the, the return of everybody going to family, kind of get you get together with your family and go see movies together. Because I think that's kind of what's special about movie. For me, the movie experience is just being able to escape. See, if a movie, like, how many movies do you watch now after watching them for when you were a child? And you go, oh, I, like, I didn't realize how cheap that looked. But you, but you never carried that with you up to your adulthood because it was always about the experience. For mm. me, that's the most important part of a movie. And the experience for this movie for me was great. It was like... um. It definitely felt like a Christmas film, which sometimes I feel a lot of Christmas movies whack. Funny, it's, I mean, it's a funny thing to say, but sometimes you're just getting Christmas vomit, which is just, you know, <laughs> o over decorations and stuff. You don't get that it's actually Christmas, that the characters feel that it's Christmas. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Does that makes sense? Yeah. We, the, the, first, the first thing you kind of notice with the, the leech, it was kind of where you realize that the leech is actually Terry, is when Father David, who is this character that is from my, from what i could see pure right he believes he's going around about life the way he's supposed to and he comes across a bum an opportunistic bum that doesn't have anywhere to go and and we've all been in that that scenario sometimes where you should have you know someone's needing a lift they've missed a taxi in this or, or, or a bus and the puddle splashes them and you're like i'm going that way but because of who he is he goes down that road, and that's kind of where it all goes tits up for him. Um, so all the all the aspects of Christmas is there, you know. Even if you're like, right, I'm not going to. How many times you say, ah, it's Christmas, and you just 
you'll just go with it. Um, <laughs> so for me, that that was a big thing because when I was taking notes, the biggest thing for me to begin and, and it gets straight into it as well. So it feels like a Christmas movie, and the characters know it's a Christmas movie. Well, they know it's Christmas. They feel like it's Christmas because there's a feel to Christmas. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. There is definitely a feel to Christmas. Yeah, and that's why well, it starts getting yeah. darker. Eh? And I think I think you nailed it right on the head by saying that mm -hmm. the the whole conceit, the idea of helping thy neighbor, is a very mm -hmm. Christmas Christian sort of fundamental. So mm -hmm. you know, it, the movie starts with that, and then you you know happen to just put it at Christmas time. I yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I think you know the idea of the the real basic idea of a guy helping someone off the street, and then sort of loses himself while trying to help the guy. You know, that was a, a real a real basic story point I had, and then the Christmas thing came shortly after when I realized how we could make it and where we could make it and the mm -hmm. fact that it would be cold and likely snowing by then. Um, and then, yeah, suddenly that that real simple thing of helping my neighbor just kind of came back around. And I, it felt like, yeah, this could be a Christmas mm -hmm. movie. And, you know, there's going to be a Christmas tree and there's going to be all, all the paraphernalia and certainly the lighting and production design lends itself to, you know, pulling out, you know, friends, Christmas lights from the attic or whatever it is. <laughs> you know, there's, there's yeah. no shortage of Christmas lights out there for, for making make it an indie film, <laughs> they're everywhere. Mm, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I think certainly just uh, the, the simple setup is very much a, a Christmas thing. The the property that's the, the kind of main hub for most of the, the action in the movie, was this, um, where, where, where is that? Is that is this a house that, that can be rented? Or was it a, was there somebody living in that house at the time? Or Yeah, so I'll go ahead and, I'll go ahead and spoil a, a, a bit of the mystique if anyone, uh, watching this doesn't want to hear this, maybe ear muff it for a second. <laughs> uh, but the exterior of the house and the interior are two different locations. Okay. Um, well, so yeah, the, and the, the, if you saw the exterior and the rest of the interior that we didn't show you, you would never guess that like we could use this like weird bed and breakfast sort of in uh, as mm. to double as like this living room and bedroom and interior. Uh, the foyer is entirely different from the living room. Uh, where the stairs come down so yeah it was fortunately just kind of you know a happy good and having savvy crew members and a great dp who can kind of see the, the the similarities between these two locations enough to say well if we light it right and we show it from just the right angle you know it, we can kind of piece these two places together but yeah that was uh, probably one of the one of the bigger headaches with making the movie was just navigating these couple different locations to feel like the same place hmm it really I does. How, <laughs> I had no idea it was the two different locations. Not at all. <laughs> I like how relatable all the characters are as well. I think we all know people in our life that are just like each one of those characters. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it is grounded almost in reality because he, the the guy that's a, a bum, Terry, um, he, I mean, we've got friends that are not necessarily on the street, but there's a there's a built in sympathy that you get from just who he is and how he carries himself. There are people like that in life where you're, you almost just sympathize with them because it's like, yeah, for a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for a while. Um, there's a, also put me in mind of a movie called Dutch. I think there's two names for it, just like the Code Dial and Santa thing. Dutch, it was, what's his name? Ed Neal. And he goes to collect his new missus. He goes to collect her son. And on, a, on the drive home, so much wrong happens on the drive home. So he's trying to do something good, but ultimately oh, yeah, yeah, it's a Thanksgiving up... movie. Um, yeah. I, I don't know yeah. what the I don't know what the other title is. But, um... Dri driving me crazy or something like that because they're on the drive <laughs> home. He, he goes to another uh, another state to pick him up, but then like the car ends up in a lake, and they're like, "Oh, how are we going to have to hitchhike?" And then they end up in a hostel and so forth. And it develops their bond, but it's all completely like arguing and shouting and screaming all the way through it. It had a feel of that as well. And again, that's something I always watch at Christmas. There was a lot in there for me that is quite nostalgic. Was that deliberate? Yeah, I think, you know, deliberate in the sense that you want to make you want to make whatever you're trying to make be believable. You know, you want it to be a believable enough situation. You want to have Terry push him in ways that are, you know, engaging and funny and all these things but also believable you know how, how far can you really go before david would put his foot down and you know, mm. when he does put his foot down it's almost too late you know he's almost gone he's yeah. gone farther than he can go so 
Yeah, there, I, I, there was definitely a balancing act of trying to figure out how much Terry could really push David's buttons. But, you know, I, I think that just the natural chemistry of those two and the types of characters when you have someone like Terry, who's all heart, he's all crazy, you know, he has a charm, he might be dirty, maybe he hasn't showered, but, you know, we all know people like that. And th th there is a charm to those types of people. Uh, they typically, you know, take things a little too far and take more than they can handle. Uh, but then you have someone like David who's just very organized and, you know, wants, wants to put himself out there as the person to help someone like Terry. But, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to help someone. It's another thing to help someone with an agenda of your own and wanting something in return. And I think that's mm -hmm. really, you know, some people have asked me, like, is, this, is, the, is the message of this movie not to help other people? And I say, <laughs> no, not at all. I, I, I think that there's nothing wrong with helping other people. There's nothing wrong with you know, offering someone a place to stay if you feel comfortable with it and you deem the person safe. But, you know, it's it's a one, it's it's gotta be a, a one way street, so to speak. You can't be trying to push something back in return. Um, mm. Particularly religion in this case is something that, mm. uh, you know, it, it is what really gets things going kind of in the wrong direction. I think we, we seem to live in an age now where people only want to help other people when they can film it and put it on their own social media. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I always find those videos just, Icky as fuck. <laughs> There's just yeah, yeah, horrible. But it's nice to know that there are still some some really good people out there. I think the obviously one of the one of the things that really stuck out to me in the movie is how easy it is to be peer pressured into doing things that you wouldn't normally do. Um, <laughs> That's that's how I ended up on this podcast. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was I was not this type of guy, and then um, this fella came along and, and changed my life. It's been amazing, but sometimes it goes the wrong way. <laughs> all right, we, we, we've all got that friend that says, "Oh, you know, stay for one more drink." You know, <laughs> J Mac, we only fucked once. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so joking. <laughs> um, that that decision to have that happen um, was that. Was that purely intended for the the co like the comedic aspect of that whole scene, or or was that just something you were like, right, this will kind of portray just how corrupt we can take one character from the start to where he kind of ends up? Yeah, I know it was always it was always there in the outline to kind of say, you know, you set <laughs> things up to make it feel as though it was all a dream, yeah. and he go he goes about a couple scenes and then finds out that it's real. Um, and, 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 and I guess, I, I guess the point of that, you know, it, it certainly takes things in a demented direction, but also it's like how, how, you know, I go back to how much can you push someone's buttons to have them really kind of keep going. And I think when the engine of his, uh, his patience is religion and this idea that he's already committed to saving these people's souls. It's kind of like, you know, regardless of what I do, even if I mess up, I'm still going to make this about you. Um, mm. And that's certainly where it sends the film into some uh, some dicey direction. But, you know, it, it's it's all been set up, hopefully, in a way that even though it's a shocking moment, um, where he decides to go from there is justified based on everything that happened before. Yeah. There's a point in the movie, and I, I, I like this sometimes. You get it in several different movies, right? Ones that make me, because I'm continuously watching the character and trying to get into the psyche where they're at. There's a scene, I'll not ruin it for everybody that's going to watch it at home, but there's a scene where he does something. We're talking about the the priest. He does something to Regal. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then he's like, oh, wait a minute, there's still, there's still a light in there. And then he's like, ah, there's that moment between you can go left or right if you yeah, go left. Yeah. And I think for him at that point, for, if I'm correct, I saw the anguish, the anguish within him. He's like, either way, I'm fucked. Yeah. <laughs> right. So let's just continue with the plan I had. <laughs> I mean, that's what I got from it. I hope, I hope I got everything that was intended. But I think as well, movies are great in the sense that if you just do what you set out to do, and everybody else takes from it. What, what it is they take from it. I think that's the best kind of movie. You know, one person can get something completely different from watching the same thing. All mm. kind of just depends on, you know, where their head goes for. I just went and watched a movie, The Menu with Ralph Fiennes, and there were so many different takeaways where I was like, ah, with that. And it's the same kind of thing. And that was the moment I saw that with with uh, Regal. <laughs> 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 and where that goes. And I'm like, it's, it's that moment where you're like, 
Oh, 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 oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just where you know where you're in the final few minutes of the film. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And we should really put a big spoiler alert on this video before we started. <laughs> no, no. I, I think the people that tune in to watch us, they, I mean, if anything, sometimes, and this is for me as well, sometimes a wee bit of spoiler will make me watch something. You know what I mean? Mm. It's just like yeah, it's it, it, it's you tough know? these days. I mean, a good movie mm -hmm. comes out and you want to talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I guess I would use Barbarian as the example to where. Oh. You know, it's just a great it's it's a great example of the public just sort of banding together and saying there is a code, and the code is that don't spoil this movie. You know, yeah, um, it's, uh, one those, it's one of those cultural things that happens every now and then. It's just it's great to see when people just really really admire, I think, the filmmaking and the narrative, and say mm -hmm. it's, it's it's not doing any of us any good to talk about this if you haven't seen. It. Yeah. Yes. I actually, I watched Barbarian with a friend of mine. Now, I don't. This is a confession. He, he might be watching this. I had already seen it. <laughs> um, but I pretended to him that I hadn't. I just wanted to see his face, <laughs> and it, it really—I've never seen a guy just change so quickly from to. <laughs> it's what a good, it's what a good movie does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the there's a, I like the the ambiguity of you, the main character as well. There's there's moments where you think he's maybe not as as perfect a, a person as he um as he pretends to be or tries to be um but again it, it just it really keeps you invested with with the the characters and it, it's really well written man I, the, there's there's not a lot of especially horror now that's coming out where it, you actually feel really invested and and this film does it very very well um thank you they, did you go to film school and stuff, or are you and stuff self-taught from the beginning? <laughs> well, you to know, end? really, my my uh, in terms of like a proper four-year film school, no, I didn't. But I, you know, when I went to college, I went as a communications major, and I, I will say, you know, there was like film classes, but there was never really like a full-on program with like the latest gear. It was really it was a little more theoretical, so it was a little more just kind of like you know, kind of like an English degree mixed with like good communication classes, but I had a great advisor and I, I feel like, you know, me before that versus me afterwards is like, you know, I didn't really know how to like talk about anything. You know, like I, I played in metal bands, like my communication was pretty much like music, like playing guitar. That was kind of like, yeah. the, that was like the first thing I got into, you know, when you're like 15 or 16 and start to define your own personality and not just listen to what other people are listening to. Mm -hmm. You know, it was metal and punk and all of that. But um, when it came time for filmmaking, it, it kind of just hit at the right time where I was able to, like, I don't know, maybe verbalize like what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why I love movies so much because I'm still very much involved with sound and music and, and all of that. It's just it kind of just, it's like this ultimate combination of every art form. Mm. No, that's brilliant. Janice Marie Faust says, I'm always looking for a good recommendation for movies, and you guys are awesome for that. Thanks, Janice. This is <laughs> one that you. you most definitely needs to watch. <laughs> uh, what, I mean, we're getting to Christmas now. What we've got a couple of days till November, uh, December. Yeah. Um, and if you're like me, every day is Christmas movie night day of December. Oh. And that includes hot. <laughs> and what? You just did, did you say no? You froze for a second. Oh, did I? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I don't um, think you froze please. literally. I think it was just digitally. Um, ah, but. okay. <laughs> digitally froze. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is this is most definitely one that uh, I've been recommending to friends for when it comes out because it's definitely, for, like I say, um, sometimes we we watch a movie and we're like, ah, oh, okay. Well, but this one we had so much to talk about because we really enjoyed it, and uh, mm. sometimes that is unfortunately because there's that many movies being made nowadays. There's so many lanes and avenues that they go down that sometimes it's not always the right one for you. And this one's right up our lane, wouldn't you say, J Mac? Yeah, all, I think I think I'm I'm pretty much. I feel like I'm done with the Hollywood machine just now. I I, I like a lot of indie stuff. Um, mm -hmm. so just keep keep bringing that stuff, and I'll be I'll be a happy bunny. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it's difficult. You know, you make these movies now, and there's you know, like you said, there's so many places to either find them or not find them. So it's mm -hmm. it's great when uh, when it when it does connect with an audience. You know, it's. Uh, my first movie, it, it was well received by uh, by you know some people, and I'm, I'm very proud of it. But I think, you know, taking that first movie out and kind of watching it, 
play with an audience at film festivals and seeing how, you know, it's a little slower in some parts. It's a little, it's a little more suspended in, in areas like that. And, and then seeing other movies that were just hitting with an audience. And it was just like the energy was there. Uh, the laughter was there, the, the gross out was there. And I, and I remember thinking to myself, like, I, I really want to make this movie the leave something that I would want to watch as an audience member. And it's kind of a, a strange thing to say, because, you know, everything you make should be for, for an audience, but um, you know, mm -hmm. really kind of tracking like where an audience is going to feel and respond throughout this movie, even though there are, you know, left turns all over the place. Uh, I, I really set out to make something that was just entertaining with this. So if it's, if it's hitting on any of those levels plus more, I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy. Absolutely. I uh, Sadistic Intentions, that's your first movie, yeah. I'm definitely going to go back and watch that. Um, almost looks like it has a Studio 666 feel to it. <laughs> I think yeah. they probably most definitely ripped you off if that's the case, <laughs> um, which happens always. Um, so we're definitely, that's another thing about us as well. If, if we enjoy something that we see, we tend to go and check out the rest of what that filmmaker has made. Yeah, um, no, no. And, I, I, I thought similarly when I saw the trailer for that. I said, well, I, I mm -hmm. think that they're probably... You know, we're kind of as interested as I was in some of those old stories of you know Led Zeppelin, Zeppelin mm -hmm. renting Alistair Crowley's house to record a new album, mm -hmm. and, you know, the, yeah. the, whatever the stories of the band going away to work out the new album and become musically inspired and all goes south. There is a, a band, and I was told this, you might be able to. I, I also, just like yourself, I played guitar for like 15 years, played in many different bands and stuff, right. So, you know, like orc metal, you know, bands that you can never read the name on the album yeah. because it's just like static. Um, there is a band like this that are like proper death pig metal, like, brrr. and apparently <laughs> the lead singer. Kev, do that again. Apparently. No, I'm not doing it again. Like <laughs> a but after, after the lead singer had recorded the album, it blew, his, it blew his brains out and they used his skull as the image art for the album and it's like he proper just blew his own brains out for the whole purpose of that album to give it some sort of gravitas is that something you're aware of well i i don't know if you if it's a if it's a is a newer band that did that because it's reminded me a lot of uh you know the, the the singer of mayhem in early, early 90s you know well, maybe that's they, it yeah they did that album dawn of the black hearts and then he blew his brains out and one of the band members discovered him took like an old like 35 millimeter photo and then they used that for the album cover but that was and that's been a while and it's not it was just a, wow. kind of like one of the earlier black metal bands um which yeah. a lot of a lot of that lore in that time period was a uh, you know some of the stuff that went into the inspiration for my first movie god i'm just looking at a picture there of the uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, it, it's still on google yeah 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 fucking hell i don't, I don't know how to <laughs> yeah. get away <laughs> sometimes sometimes don't CD. google things you know, it's, it's, it, it <laughs> leaves know, you a, a much happier person <laughs> yeah, no, no. but i mean you gotta you gotta you got appreciate the dedication to the work there right <laughs> the yeah. so what's uh, what's uh, what's next for you eric what do you have anything else in the pipeline just now are you making anything else at the minute uh yeah you know I, between these couple of movies that i've made there's a handful of scripts that you know either didn't go anywhere or could use another draft so i'm kind of looking at some older stuff and figuring out if it's worthwhile to kind of keep any of some other projects going or if i just start from scratch um you know i did promise the casting crew if i were to work with them again on the next one I'd, uh it would not be in the winter it would be like somewhere in the costa rican jungle because we were all freezing fucking cold making this movie <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't i don't know exactly what's next but uh i don't know maybe something that takes place during the daytime and takes place somewhere warm have you ever <laughs> have you ever dabbled with maybe taking a concept or an idea that already exists and making your own way with it almost like fan fiction but a bit more in depth i mean there's been you know there's certain like ip and properties around there like bigger ones and smaller ones that i've thought about you know i, I do that a lot with um, a lot of like independent published books a lot of authors i'm a fan of um I'll, I, I tend to read i try to read as much if not more than i watch movies these days mm. um, and always thinking about a lot about you know adapting something there's something that's um, interesting to me about trying to adapt a book or a novel. Or um, I think as far as, as far as a specific thing, I don't really know, but it just it kind of sounds like um, a fun challenge. There's um, there's so many great stories and folklore told throughout centuries that I think is really interesting. Uh, Stranger Things 
had taken a lot of the D and D concepts, and and now th- because of Stranger Things, there's a lot more kids now wanting to play D and D. Even just from where I live, there's a wee store that opened up, and they they have a, a something that you don't really see since at least the nineties, where people get together. You know, they pay like six pound, and they all play as part of like a wee a little cafe. Um, and I think that's quite amazing. Is there any like fo- is there is there one that you would absolutely love to say? Say you got handed a mega budget, right? And no IP is off the table. The conversation is there. Is there anything you would absolutely love, like bucket list, to take and and, and work with? I mean, on the superhero side of things, I'm not I'm not a Marvel person. I really I, I'm I'm pretty out of touch with most of those movies. But there's uh, you know one of the few graphic novels that I read was the Silver Surfer story Mm -hmm. and it's called parable and it's the one it's the one that stanley wrote and it's illustrated by uh the artist mobius morbius i forget he did a lot of the early concept art for like yodorowsky's dune that never happened uh he was involved in a lot of like early uh like alien artwork um just a fascinating i believe he's passed now french french illustrator is one of my favorite artists but uh he did the silver surfer crossover Mm. that um highly recommend everyone read it i i feel like if you're gonna you know hand a kid anything to say this is basically you know how the world runs from uh culture to politics to religion this is like kind of the perfect Mm. story told through the lens of the silver surfer which i had not known much about prior but that's something that i think would be really cool as an adaptation because it really kind of the narrative cuts through in a very uh, matter of fact, adult manner, kind of in the way Watchmen does a little bit. There's there's a few similarities with with Watchmen in it, um, but it's beautiful, beautiful mm-hmm, artwork. It, it's, it's the kind of artwork that it seems um, it reminds me a lot of like the uh, the sets and the background design, like Panos Cosmatos movies, like Beyond the Black Rainbow and Mandy. Um, mm. A lot of the aesthetic of, of his movies kind of reminds me of uh, some of the illustration that this guy Morius did. It's beautiful stuff. Hmm. So that so would be just, one, and then and then a werewolf movie. I, I mean, it's not really a franchise <laughs> thing specifically, but I would love to make a werewolf movie. I, I've gone When's down. the last time with a good one? Me? Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, there's. I'm sure there's more that are being made that I'm aware of. There could be some good ones out there I've not heard of, but um, you know, I, I, I thought I thought Dog Soldiers was great. I'm just trying to think of oh, more more recent ones. Yes. Um, dog, so- dog soldiers was brown. Yeah. I think the, the most recent one I heard of was the was it not the wolf man? Was that not like in two thousand and seven? Yeah, that was the Benicio yeah. del Toro one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. And then there's like, uh, was it Bad Moon? Was it, yeah, Bad Moon, the one that uh, Eric Red yeah. wrote and directed, I believe. Um, yeah, that's a really great movie. Really great werewolf movie. Yeah, I don't know. They're they're out there. It's like you know, it's hard to do. It's hard to do werewolves right though. Um, I think it'd be great to see a. <laughs> A, a re maybe like a retelling of the cycle of the werewolf story, which was adapted to Silver Bullet, uh, the, the, the Stephen mm-hmm. King story. Um, yeah, but that if you read if you read Cycle of the Werewolf, it's told in a very strange sort of like non traditional secular <laughs> manner, which would be really cool to see uh, in movie form because actually Cycle of the Werewolf it covers like all these different werewolf attacks on different holidays. So I felt like if you did mm-hmm. it as the movie, you could actually make like the ultimate holiday film because like something happens on Valentine's day and then something happens on, <laughs> I believe something happens on Halloween, 4th of July. It's just like all these different, each month this werewolf attack happens. And it would be cool to see a movie do something sort of, uh, narratively non-traditional. You're so right. Yeah, I, I think that like S- silver bullet is, is, uh, I mean, it's a film that I saw when I was way too young to see it. Um, but I think it, it maybe as a victim of the time it was made now, I think that, revisiting that now could be one of the one of the rare examples of something that gets remade and is actually better um yeah it's a, it's a, i think it's a great movie yeah I, I, I love it gary Busey is just endlessly <laughs> entertaining he doesn't even have to try yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely it'd be transylvania six five thousand that's my childhood um, oh yeah yeah werewolf one <laughs> like i saw i saw someone one. in the chest said wolf cop too i, I yeah, saw wolf, wolf cop went I'm I'm due for a wolf a wolf cop rewatch. I remember seeing it when it first came out. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> wolf cop. <laughs> See, just the, the the title wolf cop. I mean, I'm all over that, and and I love the the fact the posters like what is it uh, the cobra, isn't it? Yeah, it looks yeah, like the yeah, Stallone yeah. cobra. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it looks like Stallone. <laughs> That's a sure way to get us in, right? <laughs> Team Wolf. Team Wolf was a great. I mean, yeah. 
Uh, I mean, it was fun. <laughs> I don't think it's a, a a great werewolf movie. I think it's a great eighties comedy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wolf movie. Yeah, but no, you're right. It'd be it'd be really cool to see a really good, well done, wolf movie. Let's make it. Someone, nah. someone make it. Someone needs to make <laughs> it's, it. Nah. It's a fun mythology. I mean, it's like every every country has a different werewolf mythology. So much so that even sort of the Northmen, you know, the new Robert Eggers movie was a bit of a, mm. a, a bit of a Norse werewolf because it's the mm. berserker mythology. It's it's not man turning into an actual wolf, but suddenly man acts like a wolf to go into battle. And I thought that that movie did a really good job of mm. tackling some of the berserker mythology. But yeah, you know, the, the, the French werewolf mythology uh, is, is another interesting one. It, it kind of gets, it gets crazy. It gets all over the place. It, there's a lot of oh. opportunity I think, for different, a different cultural look at the werewolf do you do you have a, a a dream a dream team that you'd like to work with have you got a specific actor in mind that you'd love to work with one day um you know gosh you know i the first person that comes to my mind because i was just talking about her with a filmmaker who just worked with her is jenna maloney who just did this movie called swallowed with the director carter smith he directed the ruins uh in mm -hmm. 2008 you remember that movie? Yeah, I remember um, that. I met him, met him in Fright Fest this year, and we were having dinner, and he just made his new movie called Swallow that was at the festival as well with Jenna Maloney, and I was kind of amazed, and I remember that she was in the ruins, but I was like, you know, just talking to him about what, what she was like and how much I would love to work with her. Uh, I'm a big fan of the movie Inherent Vice, and she is in that, and just like one of my favorite characters amongst all the many crazy characters in that movie. So, you know, I, I see her as someone uh, I see her in movies pretty regularly, and I, I think to myself, I'd love to work with her. I don't really know in what, but there's something about her that's just kind of uh, magnetic as a person on, on the movies. Mm -hmm. uh, just to, to go back to the, the leech again, <laughs> went off on a big tangent there, um, but uh, is it getting a theatrical release, any kind of limited theatrical release, or is it all just uh, is it just going on the streaming and um, Blu-ray DVD? Yeah, there's, there's no proper theatrical release, meaning that no one on uh, the aero side of things, which is, you know, UK, Ireland, US, Canada, it's not playing a theatrical run there. It has been picked up for a few one-off theatrical screenings, and it's available for booking for, for individual events like that, certainly after its festival run. Um, but yeah, really, the, the way to watch is going to either be, you know, streaming it on Aero Player, iTunes, Amazon, or uh, picking up that beautiful deluxe edition blu-ray if you're a mm. purveyor, purveyor of physical media like we are yeah it might it might be one for the collection <laughs> it looks good yeah. i you know i was had i got a box in recently and i took that wrapping off and slid it on the shelf next to my other arrow titles and it looks good <laughs> that must be a feeling itself eh? just putting it back standing back and going it's there now forever yeah yeah i, I slid yeah. i think i slid it right between uh between wild things and deep red of all my other hey <laughs> wild things. i watched wild things many times as a kid <laughs> so i, I, I just rewatched it it's a great movie it, that is a the perfectly just like out, out of control sleazy 90s thriller it's so good I, so, and it's yeah. the director who did henry portrait of a serial killer i mean what else do you want <laughs> Do you know, I, I haven't seen that yet. I started watching it when I was way too drunk to stay awake and I forgot <laughs> to watch it again. Yeah, I, I need to see that. It's Michael, Michael Rooker, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's one of the more uh, deranged movies ever made. <laughs> that sounds right up my alley. Um, but yeah, uh, again, The Leech, uh, I, would, I would recommend it to, to anybody that, that likes a good, a good horror uh, mm -hmm. and a good comedy and smash those two together you get absolute gold so uh th thank you and and obviously thank you to arrow for uh being nice enough to send us the the screener for it so mm -hmm. um yeah it's it's it's, it's going to go on my list of one of the the ones to watch for i don't know i might watch it every christmas never know <laughs> <laughs> home alone like then the leech. <laughs> there you go <laughs> the yeah, only yeah, one thing the only one thing is i was kind of expecting to see a leech in it because we did <laughs> I don't do the trailers and that. If I'm going to watch something, purely just go straight in, right? Not knowing what to expect. And I was like, ah, the leech. <laughs> but then I got it and I was like, oh, well, oh okay, okay. <laughs> I, you know, I, I won't spoil the special features too much, but I will say if you watch the special features, there's a, a video essay done by this incredible uh, journalist who's named Anton Battelle. He's written about a couple of my movies before, but he 
put together this wonderful video essay. And for a brief moment, he does get into the actual anatomy of a leech. Uh, and he reveals, which I was not aware when we made the joke, uh, you know, when David says, I'm celibate, and Terry says, well, what does that mean? Do you have both parts? You know, he's, he, he, he's, he's mixing up hermaphrodite with, uh, with celibate. But it turns out that leeches actually are leeches are hermaphrodites, and I did not know that oh. until this. So it's uh, you know, if, for those of you that are disappointed that there's not an actual leech in the movie, I'd say watch the special features because it, it, <laughs> it, it ties some interesting threads together that you and I wasn't aware of. So I, I, love fact, I, I love the fact that Kevin was expecting a, a creature feature, <laughs> like <laughs> just a leech. Yeah, <laughs> gonna get I love, I, I love, I love the fact that a leech can not only suck somebody else, but it can suck itself. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you today, Eric. Um, and we're really looking forward to seeing what you do next. Um, like I say to everybody at home watching this and everybody that watches us after the after this show, because that's where a lot of you are, definitely go ahead and get the DVD if you can on the Blu-ray. Go to Amazon and type in the leech. It's there. The links are all in the description. Um, if you don't do physical media, which for some reason the majority don't, you can get it on Prime. Arrow Video uh, is definitely one for watching. If you want to get all cozy, put a blanket on, hot water bottle, cup of chai <laughs> for uh, this Christmas, stick on the leech because uh, you will not be disappointed. If you don't like yeah. it, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> I, I, I'd suggest a nice warm glass of whiskey or a warm glass of milk, whichever side of the corn you fall on. Oh, whiskey. Yeah, that was definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I got no time to heat to heat that up. <laughs> Straight in the hatch. But it's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, like I say, you're welcome back on, on here anytime, and we'll uh, definitely keep an eye on what you've been up to. Yeah, thank you both. This is an honor. Right. And thanks for everyone who's uh, been chiming in. Absolutely. Yeah, thank pleasure. you. Hang around, hang around for a couple of minutes after we we come off, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Um, but good. thanks, okay. thanks for coming on, Eric. Cheers. Absolutely. Bye. Thanks again, guys, and enjoy the rest of your night. And we'll see you guys next week. Take it easy, guys. <laughs>